the, the, uh, you might have a question of uh, what theories does this work in? And in fact, there's uh, now so many I have trouble keeping track of it. Uh, but uh, thankfully, in our review, there's tables that'll tell you exactly what's been done uh, and references for them. Uh, but let me just go through that quickly. Uh, there's two basic classes of theories where these types of constructions work. Uh, is the gravitational theories and non-gravitational theories. And the gravitational theories is various kinds. There's the, the most straightforward ones are the ungauged supergravities where you can do the double copy. Uh, there's examples, Yang Mills, Einstein's theories, and, and then uh, more recently, uh, gauge supergravities. Uh, so let's just have a quick run through this. Uh, so this is out of our review. Uh, so the, uh, like the, uh, up at the top you can see n greater than or equal to 4 supergravity, and that I'll explain a little bit about uh, doing that, at least in simple cases. Um, and then you can add matter, mul uh, matter multiplets. Uh, there's cases uh, n less than 4 supergravities, and many times when you do the double copy, you have too many states. So then what you do is you throw in some ghosts, negative norm states, cancel out the garbage you don't want. Uh, and and, and that, that's uh, kind of interesting that you could do that. Um, and then uh, there's all sorts of extended supergravities, uh, you know, more, more than, uh, you know, more than you can, at least than I can count, uh, how many different types of constructions there are now. There's, uh, here's another class, uh, higher dimension operators. If you want to add higher dimension operators to the, uh, to the uh, gravity side, what do you do on the, uh, on, uh, on this side, uh, somewhere along the other, conformal supergravity. There's an odd one. Oh, here's a here's another strange one, BLG theory. That's not even based on a Lie algebra. It's something called a three algebra, and it anyway, it, the same type of construction works just fine. Uh, there's the gauge supergravities, and then uh, some I interesting cases of non-gravitational theories. There's Dirac Born infold theory related to the nonlinear sigma model uh, with, a, uh, with a, the other copy being a Yang Mills theory, and then all sorts of different uh, variants on that. Uh, and one thing I think is pretty clear is there's a lot more coming, especially in the supergravity uh, theories. There's an uh, endless number of supergravity theories, so there's a lot, a lot more that can be done. Uh, so why don't we get rid of this? Uh, projector, and then we will just head into loops. Uh, so, uh, the way he works at loop level uh, is actually kind of surprising. Uh, it took us uh, two years and five minutes to figure it out, so it was two years of asking how to do it, and then five minutes saying, oh yeah, it's obvious. Um, so let me just write down the answer, the obvious answer. Uh, what you do is you just basically write down the same thing that you wrote down at uh, tree level. So we'll write A uh, L loops, uh, say an, an endpoint function, Okay, there's some normalizations, coupling constants. So L is the number of loops. And then here we have, uh, we sum over permutations of external legs. Um, so we want manifest crossing symmetry in the diagram. Uh, would be a good thing to have. And then what you do is you sum over the diagrams that are uh, built out of cubic vertices, so, well, I guess I don't have to write it since I already wrote it, but diagrams like this. Uh, so uh, we're only using uh, three-point vertices. So that's the sum over those diagrams. Then uh, at loop level, well, you put in a loop integral, L equals one to L d d p L over two pi to the d, and then uh, uh, <coughs> and then we put in color factor, numerator factor, 
and then uh, Feynman propagators. <coughs> and uh, one extra thing that's new at loop level is there can be symmetry factors. So let me put that in. So that's symmetry factor. So it's really the most obvious thing you could have written down. And indeed, this thing does work. I'll, in fact, show you uh, a little bit later three loop construction uh, for n equals four super Yang mills, and then uh, and then uh, the supergravity case. Now, um, the double copy, as you can imagine, it's all kind of the same. What we're going to do is uh, if see, this time the if is actually uh, uh, a non-trivial if uh, if C i plus C j plus C k equals zero implies N i plus N j plus uh, N k equals zero. If we can figure out a set of numerators where this is true, then uh, gauge to gravity is what you might have guessed. Ci goes to Ni. And it's uh, this step that's not trivial. This part is actually pretty easy to prove using unitarity. Uh, but th this if uh, is unproven. There's no proof of this. Um, but in, in uh, physics, there's a much more important question whether you can prove it. And that's whether it's, whether it's useful. And useful it is. That part we do know. Uh, proof, a general proof at loop level, we do not have. And in fact, uh, sometimes it can be hard to construct exactly what these numerators are. For example, five loop uh, n equals four super Yang nils is a case where it's not so easy to do this. Um, but let me actually be a little more specific. Maybe just show you exactly what I mean by this. Uh, so let's look at uh, at loop level. So let's say we have a one loop diagram. So by n of this thing, I mean the numerator, because if I didn't do that, and then I try to write an equation uh, when I really mean the numerator, but the diagrams, you're going to think I'm writing a wrong equation. Uh, so. Let me write it with a certain set of signs. So there's a set of signs here, plus or minus signs. They're completely correlated between the two equations. But in each equation, I can like, flip things over. It's anti-symmetric. So I can, the signs are, are ill-defined. It depends how I draw the diagram. Uh, that's the plus and minus signs. But whatever sign I use here, it's the same signs here. So that completely correlated. So, an example would be, let's say, the numerator of this one, and I can rewrite that as the numerator of this, one, two, three, four. This one, two, three, four, minus the numerator, and then let's reverse that. That's two, one, three, four. So, um, so this is, this, is, uh, this is exactly what I mean. The numerator of this diagram satisfies exactly the same Jacobi identity. This, uh, if I put a C here, meaning the color factor of these diagrams, that's the Jacobi identity. Here, it's a kinematic identity. Okay, so that's what I mean by uh, by this. Um, now, maybe one comment about that is a set of labels. When you, when you do this, see there's a part of the diagram, this part, and then around here, which is different in all three diagrams, but the rest of the diagram is the same. So the labels that I should be using are not, are, are not like this label or this label. I should be using these labels, the labels that are common to all the diagrams. So the loop momentum, for example, wants to be the same in all. So the rest of it, see the rest of it uh, uh, um, 
Now I want I want this, these parts of the diagram to be to be the same. Okay. Um, so maybe uh, uh, let me uh, um, show you a, a nice example based on n equals four super yang mills. But before I do that, let me derive a nice formula that will allow us to write down uh, expressions for four point one loop. Uh, supergravity for n equals 4 supergravity, uh, for n equals 5 supergravity, n equals 6, and n equals 8, all in one go. So, um, remember what I said that uh, when you do the double copy, you only need one copy to be in a form where, the, where this holds. And the other copy, you write it in any form that's convenient. And, and that actually is a huge advantage because it allows you to to play games where you can write down simple formulas uh, in a relatively easy way or to, or to um, uh, compute supergravity amplitudes where you know this explicitly only for one of the copies and for the other copy you believe it to be true but you, know, you still haven't found uh, these numerators. So let me show you a color formula at one loop that's actually pretty helpful. And I'll show you how to derive it. It's, it's pretty simple. One, two, three, four, which I'll define as a color factor. It'll be a color factor of a box diagram. Okay, and this, uh, that, that C1234 is the color of this diagram. One, two, three, four. Okay, and the same for the other one. So the color of the box diagram. Okay, how do you derive it? Well, the answer is just the Jacobi identity. What I do is, um, let's say I have a contribution to the amplitude that's built from that kind of diagram with this color factor. All I do is I use the Jacobi identity to eliminate this in favor of the color structure I want, namely the, the box diagram. So this is just the Jacobi identity that I'm writing. One, two, three, four, minus Uh, two, one, three, four, and then we can also do play the same type of game for diagrams like this. We can eliminate them in favor of this type of diagram, which you then eliminate in terms of, of uh, the box diagram. Uh, So that's uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 1, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. It's the color of this. Okay, that's basically how you prove it and, and what these A's are. These are one loop partial amplitudes. Uh, but anyway, they're gauge invariant because you've eliminated all the, uh, the Jacobi identities. Uh, so these are independent color factors and uh, and you can do this in general. If there's uh, Dixon, Del Duca, and Maltoni, uh, so th this th this decomposition is uh, is uh, DDM decomposition. Um, so so this formula, this one, is very general. Just color it. So this is true for any theory. Uh, so this could be for a QCD. If you have fundamental representation. There's some differences exactly what you want to put here, but anyway, it's, it's not a big deal to put in fundamental representation, but adjoint representation, it's, uh, it's any theory of, let's see, Yang-Mills, no supersymmetry, n equals one supersymmetry, n equals two, and so forth. Okay, so let's uh, 
store that formula. Okay. Now, um, next thing, let's have a look at uh, uh, just you know checking out a an amplitude uh, n equals four uh, super Yang mills at uh, one loop. And I'll just quote the answer, and then actually, if I have enough time, I'll even prove it uh, using unitarity if I'm fast enough. Um, but the, the, this amplitude, one of these color ordered pieces, is one of those. So this would be uh, a one loop. And then I'll make it n equals four super Yang Mills with the ordering one, two, three, four. It's a very nice formula. Uh, Ig to the fourth, st, a4, tree, one, two, three, four, uh, times a certain integral, which is just the box integral. So uh, i4, st, minus i, d, d, l, over two pi to the d. Uh, L square L minus P1 square L minus P1 minus P2 square L plus P4 square. Yeah, I wrote it out, but anyway, it's just the integral you would get if this was a phi cubed box, a uh, phi cubed field theory, just with Feynman propagators. Uh, and this is the answer, variant equals four super Yang mills. And we might ask a little question. Uh, does this thing satisfy the duality? Uh, and we'll, you know, we could go check it. Now, notice there's no triangles. Uh, no bubbles, no triangles, no bubbles. Remember that, that's gonna be kind of interesting later. So let's go look at our identity. It's a very boring identity. There's no, there's no Triangles. Well, this is for the color, but uh, we can rewrite it for numerators. So what this identity says is if there's no triangle, then these two must be equal. And we can just have a look at that. Is it true that if I relabel, are the numerators equal? The numerator is this object. And this thing has a crossing symmetry uh, that's the, the amplitude identity I proved before. Oops. Oh. Well, I guess I'll erase this. Uh, bad news, it's got wet. Uh, oh well. Ah, uh, no. Yeah, maybe. This was the magic eraser that actually worked. Oh. <laughs> okay, live and learn. Oh, maybe. Right. Okay. Oh. Okay, thanks. Um, so, uh, well, we had proved we had, we had proved uh, the amplitude. I just recall it from the last lecture. Uh, St. A tree, one, two, three, four, is equal to SU, A, one, two, four, three. So if I permute it, it's the same thing. Okay, I, I put a redundant S in there, but if cross out the S's, it's the same amplitude identities I had before, and also equal to uh, TU, A, one, four, two, three. So then, you see, it, it has exactly the property uh, that we want. Now, uh, no one noticed this, uh, you know, we, we've known these amplitudes for, uh, you know, uh, 30, 35 years or so, but uh, no, one, no one really took notice of this because uh, it, it's just such a simple amplitude. I mean, what do you make of this? It looks like an accident. Uh, of course, it's not an accident. Now, these are the, 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 this basically is the statement the numerator identities work. So 
so from that, uh, immediately say, oh, I know what I can do with this. Uh, I can go to that formula, for example, and I can just stick in these numerators instead of the color factors. So immediately I have uh, one loop uh, n equals 8 supergravity. If this is n equals 4 super Yang mills, right, n equals 8, the way I get it is I take n equals 4 times n equals 4, and that gives me the n equals 8 supergravity. It's just that simple. Uh, and I can put in the coupling constant STA tree, 1, 2, 3, 4, squared. So the squares of. Identities work. Uh, square it, and then I just have to add up the, uh, the, the box integral. So times I uh, ST plus I SU plus I of TU. So put a 4 there. And that's my n equals 8 supergravity amplitude, just like that. So that's pretty cool. And, and this thing, if uh, you apply the, these amplitude identities, this thing, and also there were the, the KLT relation, you can rewrite this. This factor is STU, a gravity tree, the n equals 8 tree, which is good. It looks a little weird with a super Yang Mills. This is a super Yang Mills tree. So that looks a little weird, but anyway, this can be converted to a form that makes more sense uh, pretty easily. Okay, so that's pretty simple. But the fun thing is, you see, this formula up here, okay, let's go over here. Uh, this formula, this holds uh, for any theory. So let me convert this formula to supergravity. So let's make that like an M for gravity. So this is gravity. And what I'm going to do, uh, N, well, this will be uh, N plus 4 supergravity. So uh, let's take one copy to be N equals 4 and the other copy to be n equals 1, n equals 0, n equals 2. I shouldn't say n equals 3, because you know n equals 3 happens to be n equals 4, but never mind. But I mean, this can be whatever you like. And then all I do, I come over here, I put this in, and I suppose uh, somewhere I have, I should write what the n's are, the n, uh, that in the, these ends, one, two, three, four, that was ST A tree, uh, one, two, three, four. And this is for any of them. This thing is crossing symmetric. So that immediately gives me a nice formula uh, for the supergravity just by sticking this in. And, and in fact, what's kind of amazing, because this does not depend on loop momentum, this numerator. And that's an accident of this being very simple. And because it doesn't depend on loop momentum, see, I kind of wrote it outside the integral. There's an integral buried in here. And these numerators don't depend on, on loop momentum, so I can pull them out. So this is actually a re relation on the final integrated result, which is pretty cool. And there's other examples where you can do this. So th th this, th at least the, the, the special trickery of no loop momentum in the numerator, that's very special to uh, these examples of four point, also at five points for one loop, that's true. And another example that's very cool that uh, Lance wrote a paper on is uh, the two loop case 
Again, you can do a construction just like this, on, and it applies to the final integrated result. Okay. Uh, now, in general, the construction the, the construction is going to work in general. It's just that if the numerator depends on loop momentum, I can't pull it out of the integral. So I have a different integral. Okay. But of course, uh, I can still go ahead and use it. Okay. Now, um, we're going to talk about uh, examples um, uh, at loop level. So there's a tool I, w I just want to talk about uh, some, uh, which is generalized unitarity. And one reason this is important is because we don't have any proof that these double copy formulas work or that the BCJ representations work. You need a way of, of, uh, of checking that it's true. So to do that, you use unitarity. Okay, and uh, the way we're going to define it is simply um, as uh, removing the integration symbol and then replacing some propagators with on-shell delta functions. And the idea is that uh, we're supposed to take a loop amplitude and chop it into smaller pieces where these blobs uh, would be some set of tree amplitudes. It could be some high point function. So these are trees. These lines, what they represent is uh, on-shell on -shell delta functions. They just impose the on-shell conditions. And then you're supposed to, uh, supposed to sum over the states, sum over states. And um, so let's write it, maybe let me write down a formula which would be the sum over a product of trees, and this is the sum over states. Okay, and then um, what you do is, uh, in this way, you decompose a loop amplitude into these tree amplitudes, the tree amplitudes you know, and the basic trickery uh, is you try you match uh, the loop amplitude against these product of trees once you've imposed these on-shell conditions. Normally we work with an ansatz, uh, and what I mean by that is you write down an expression for the loop amplitude that has some arbitrary parameters, and then you impose the cut conditions, and you compare it to the truth that you obtain from the trees. And then you solve for these parameters. And that's generally a good way of doing it. I mean, sometimes it can get a little, uh, a little complicated if you, don't do it, if you don't do it very well. But it has one very big advantage, is when you use an ansatz, you declare, I want my amplitude to have the following properties because your ansatz enforces those properties. For example, you might like manifest crossing symmetry would be a good example. You might like locality. That's a pretty good, a pretty good property. And there might be other properties that you might like, certain power countings or, or other things. Okay. Now, that of course was too quick, so the right thing to do is let's see if we can work, work out an example uh, one example um, of unitarity, how we're going to do it. So the best example is a one-loop example for n equals four super Yang Mills theory. So I'll outline it and give you homework. Hmm. Let's try the wet one. Okay, so let's look at the two particle cuts. 
of, so I'm going to cut like this. There's a tree amplitude, tree amplitude. I put these legs on shell. And, and what I want to do is use this information, this on shell data from these trees summed over the state to construct the loop amplitude. So, so let me define the cut. By the way, this is not uh, the traditional way that when people say cuts, they actually are referring to branch cuts, dispersion relations. But uh, this is, uh, yeah, I don't know, you could say a descendant of those ideas. Um, so let's define the cut. So th this dotted me line means I want this to be on shell. Say one, two, three, four. Um, and then I, I have uh, L1 this way, L2 that way. I'm going to slightly abuse my notation here. Uh, if I write L1, but then when it comes to the external legs, I'm too lazy to write P, so I'll just write 1 and then 2. Okay, L3 times uh, tree amplitude, 4 point minus L3, 3, uh, 4, L1. Okay. Now, um, let me just uh, jump at the answer, and then, then I'll explain uh, uh, how it works. So in n equals 4 super Yang mills, what you're supposed to do is sum over all the states. So of course, there are, in n equals 4 super Yang mills, there's going to be uh, two gluon states, or let's call it one gluon. Uh, there's four uh, fermions and uh, six real scalars. And in the sum, you're supposed to include everything. Uh, if you do that, let me tell you what the answer is. It's actually very neat in n equals 4 super Yang mills. Uh, L1 minus P1 square. And for homework, I'll, you can work this out. And I'll, I'll, let me give you a few more details about that. Um, and th this is just a tree amplitude. And by the way, this is true for any state, any external state. And it's also true in D dimension. So you can use dimensional regularization on this. Yeah? So when you mean cut the uh, diagram, you're not, you're, not you're not integrating over the... That's diagram. correct. Indeed, that's what my, my comment of it being a descendant of the ideas of the six. I am not integrating over phase space. Uh, it's much better to do it this way, at, le at least for this class of problems that uh, we're interested in. Let's say like constructing high loop order supergravity would be, uh, okay. So um, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, let me just show you, uh, show you how you would prove this. Uh, well, let's say in four dimensions, you would uh, probably use helicity would be a good way to do it. So maybe you pick some helicity states. And I'm going to pick one that happens to be particularly good. It's a kind of naughty cut because it's much simpler than it should be in this cut when you put this to be a plus helicity. So there's outgoing convention. All legs are outgoing when I'm doing the helicity. Uh, when I take this to be a plus and plus, then in fact the scalars, uh, they're not contributing to this cut or if I, if I, or minus minus. When I do minus minus, then what happens is in this cut, I don't get uh, scalars or fermions, so it's actually just one, uh, it's just gluon states that are propagating. If I were to do the other channel, it's not that simple. Of course, for homework, you should do the other channel as well. But the way we do it, just uh, so you can have a good idea, is I write down the tree amplitude. So this is that uh, famous Park-Taylor formula. 2L2, 
L2, L1. So that's one tree. There's another tree. The sum over states in this case is very simple. Like I say it's only, uh, it's only uh, one set of states that are propagating. And, and that's, that's special uh, to the choice I made on helicity. So, and then, uh, so this thing, the way you, you uh, want to clean this thing up is you want to rationalize it. So you want to do um, 2 L2 and write it as 2 L2. Uh, by the way, I'm pretty sure my sign convention for the uh, spinners is backwards from Uton's, but uh, where's Uton? But okay. But, but uh, you maybe you have to watch out for that. There's some sign conventions. Anyway, in our review, we have certain sign conventions. Uh, so you use this to rationalize. You, you take all these spinners and you rewrite it so it looks like Feynman propagators. So you can actually recognize what the thing is. And then you have uh, square brackets or angle brackets so, uh, up in the numerator. Well, there'll be, in this case, it's all square brackets in the numerator. And then what you do is you chain it all together uh, in order to form a trace. So the, the, the chain that you get it looks like this for L1, L1, oh, oops, uh, I goofed, it's a square bracket, uh, L1, L2, um, L2, 3, 3, 2, oops, times uh, 3, 2, 2, L2, L1, L2. And this thing you rewrite as a trace, trace of uh, a half 1 plus gamma 5. And then it's L1 slash, P1 slash, you know, P4 slash, etc. And then you evaluate the trace and then you shake it. And then uh, if you shake it sufficiently well, you get that formula. Okay, so why don't you, uh, anyway, push that through for homework. Uh, the, other, the other cut is more fun. So if, you're, if you have the minus and the plus on one side of the cut, so you're cutting it the other way, then you have, you have to sum over all the states. Uh, but anyway, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, that, that's also uh, pretty straightforward. It's not too hard to do that. Uh, hopefully following Newton's lecture can be too hard. Okay, so what are we going to do with this? We have a great formula for a product of trees appearing in the unitarity cut, right? Those are trees. What are you going to do with it? Well, let's suppose you happen to want gra gravity, like maybe you're interested in uh, properties of gravity loop amplitudes, how do they behave in the ultraviolet, for example. So it's now very straightforward because we have our KLT formula. So if I'm interested, suppose we want n equals 8 supergravity and one loop. Well, we're going to do a cut that looks like the sum over the n equals 8 states. We're going to have a tree amplitude of gravity. Uh, oh, I called it. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, I guess I changed my notation, L1 and L2. Well, let's make it, uh, let's make it, uh, you 
one, two, three, four, L1 and L3. So suppose I want to evaluate uh, this thing. It's pretty obvious what I should do, right? I just want to apply the KLT factorization on each tree. So what's very cool about this way of thinking about gravity loops is the information, the non-trivial information we have, how a, a gravity tree amplitude can be related directly to a Yang-Mills tree amplitude, you just import it. So the formula is minus s square, uh, this, the, uh, uh, the gauge n equals 4. Uh, so we have to sum over those states. A tree minus L1. 1, 2, L3 times A4 tree L3, 3, 4, L1. So I'm just applying KLT to, to, uh, to this. So this, this is one of the KLT factors uh, from, from here. This is one of the KLT factors. This is one KLT factor from there. Then the second KLT factor, which gauge uh, n equals 4, it's the same thing except I'm supposed to twist some legs. So let me swap those two legs. One, two, minus L1 times a4 tree, L134 minus L3. So this thing factorizes. Each one, each term here, is, is something I've already evaluated. See, this is what you want to do in, an, in any kind of amplitudes calculation. Uh, instead of starting fresh, you want to say, what did I learn last year or, what, or last lecture? And then I want to apply that to this lecture. Uh, so this formula, this thing, it's just that. Except maybe some labels that we have to you know, keep an eye out. There's some labels. Um, so it's now very straightforward. There's this one little trick that, that you need. There's a partial fractioning. You'll discover you have too many propagators when you, when you work that out. You, you, you stick in the solution. Actually, let me just do that. Uh, so that cut to the n equals 8 supergravity. Uh, if we evaluate that using that formula, we get STA tree. 1, 2, 3, 4 for the external legs, that thing squared, and then we get uh, L1 minus P1 squared, L1 plus P4 squared, and then uh, L3 plus P1 squared, uh, L3 plus P4 squared. Uh, and then you look at this thing and you say, hmm, that's kind of an odd guy because it's got too many propagators. It's supposed to represent some kind of diagram. I mean, this thing is supposed to represent, maybe it represents like a box diagram. It would be a good guess of what that thing should be. Notice the box diagram has one propagator times another propagator. That's two propagators. How come I got four propagators? So. If you think about it a little bit, what, what could be the problem? Remember, in uh, n equals 8 supergravity, there's no color ordering. So when you're looking at the S-channel cut, you're mixing in somebody else. Two, one, th 
three, four. See, this box, like the cut of this box, right? There's one propagator here, another propagator here. Okay, there's two. But suppose I put them on a common denominator. How many propagators do I get? Four. So what you gotta do is you have to partial fraction this. So partial fractions, just so you can recognize it. So partial fraction and you want to partial fraction it into these box diagrams and when you do that after the partial fractioning I'll leave that for a homework assignment, you just do the partial fractioning uh, it's in the notes of course, you can uh, so maybe it's not a very good homework assignment since it's in the notes but uh, <coughs> but anyway it's uh, uh, anyway, you partial fraction it um, and in fact, it, indeed, the cut is the final answer for the cut. One, two, three, four. Also, we clean up this uh, uh, yang Mills tree square. We clean it up using amplitude relation and KLT relation. We turn it into a gravity tree, so, so it looks nice. And then uh, it's times uh, one over L1 minus P1 square plus 1 over L1 minus P2 square. That's one factor. And the other factor is L 1 over L3 minus P3 square plus uh, 1 over L3 uh, minus P4 square. Uh, so that's, in fact, a collection of four boxes. What are four boxes doing there? Well, let's, uh, have, let's just write out what that is. So that, that uh, final answer whoa, to the, after the partial fractioning, it's these four boxes. Uh, one, two, three, four, two, one, three, four, one, two, four, three, and one, two, four, three. And let's indicate that the cut conditions are active. These are on shell uh, delta functions, not propagators. And if you look carefully, you'll notice one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. These are the same boxes. This box is the same as that. So there's a factor of two. I'm wondering what's a factor of two doing there? Well, you might remember uh, there's a phase space symmetry factor of one half. So that doubling, the two, gets eaten by that phase space symmetry factor. And the final answer when you ask what function is it? that looks like a collection of boxes, and only boxes. What function is it, like cuts of boxes, sorry. What, uh, if you're looking at a collection of, of cuts of boxes, what function is it that has those cuts? And the answer is, of course, boxes, right? So you can immediately just write down what the answer is uh, for one loop in supergravity, n equals eight, uh, STU, M tree one, two, three, four plus one, two, four, three plus one, four, two, three. And in fact, this is exactly the same answer I got by doing this. Uh, double copy by replacing color factor to numerator factor. But except here I actually derived it from unitarity. So this one is definitely right. The other one you might argue, well how do you know it's right? Well, okay, this is how we know it's right. Okay. Now, um, when you get to more complicated cases, you have to put uh, unitarity on steroids. And uh, not just these simple cuts like that. Uh, 
the best way, at least at present, uh, there's, uh, I think some good ideas about how to do better, but at least at present is, um, is this uh, me method of maximal cuts. Um, and, and it's a way of organizing things where you work from simpler cuts to more complicated cuts very systematically by a set of levels and you, and you uh, hunt down missing pieces one by one. Um, and, and this is one of the tools that actually becomes important as you start getting up to high loop orders. So let me just say a couple words about that. Uh, so is this I comes so there's some chalk that's good and some chalk that's bad. Anyway. Um, okay. So for example, something like this is not a diagram. It's a, it's a set of cuts, but it's a very simple set. Uh, and in this set of cuts, everything is just three-point functions. Uh, now, at the moment, it's not it, uh, what I'm talking about. I'm not going to keep track of what's MHV, what's anti-MHV. I think in later, uh, in later uh, uh, lectures, you're going to see different colorings, black and white. Uh, to for MHV or anti-MHV, depending on helicity, but I'm not going to make that distinction here. All we have are uh, just three-point vertices, and they're placed on shell, and we can call them three-point amplitudes. And the cool thing about this, this set of cuts is we'll call these MCs, like maximal cuts, so it's the maximum number of, of legs are placed on shell. And the cool thing is that um, is that th uh, this set of cuts, the du double copy works immediately. I mean, it's kind of trivial. Uh, actually, you, heard, you basically heard it in Newton's lecture, although he probably didn't say it explicitly, that uh, there's just simple formulas for these vertices that, uh, uh, in terms of the helicity that you can just write down immediately, and they immediately satisfy all the double copy uh, properties in a trivial way. The vertices just square the gravity vertices, are squares of Yang Mills vertices, kind of trivially. Okay, so in, in this one, you could say this: uh, the double copy just works. Okay, uh, and then there's uh, you can go to the next most complicated set of cuts, which we'll call the next to maximal cuts. So let's like so. Let's say this would be called a next to maximal cut. And then you can go to the next square maximal, and so on and so forth. And the question is, where do you stop? And the answer is, that depends on what theory you're doing, what the power counting is. Uh, basically, you, you should stop when there's no more terms to be found. Um, Let's see, this would be uh, an x squared maximum cut. Uh, so in this hierarchy, this cut contains previous cuts. So if you explode out these blobs, uh, then uh, uh, you'll recognize earlier cuts. Like, for example, if you exploded this out into, in, into a five-point tree diagram, like you just explode it out, you'll find Let's say, for example, this one would be included in there. Uh, so the extra information in these cuts, uh, these are contact terms. And what contact terms? Well, let's say right there. See, I have a cut condition. This thing is, let's call it L8 square equals zero. That's a cut, con that's a cut condition. If I have a numerator proportional to L8 square, I don't see it in this cut but I see it in this one, okay? Um, and uh, there's a concept that we call the spanning set of cuts. Uh, the spanning set is the set of cuts that you need to determine everything. And, and it's a kind of simple exercise because you can think, 
what are the set of all possible terms I could get in my expression, and then you have to make sure that you've written down enough cuts that actually uh, identifies every single term or identifies every coefficient of every single term. Okay, and that's basically how it, how it goes. So I only have five minutes to do three loops, so let me just start talking about how we're going to do three loops. So as, as you go up to more and more complicated problems, you would like uh, not just this set of tools, but you want always better tools. Uh, in general, these better tools are discovered by using the earlier tools to then uh, do some calculation and then identify a, uh, some kind of a pattern. So let's uh, talk about three loops. Uh, I'm not going to do three loops in five minutes, but um, the power counting of n equals 8 supergravity uh, and, and also n equals 4 super Yang mills uh, is such that um, this is the only set of diagrams that you need. You can actually see right here these box diagrams. See there's a box. Remember we had someplace over there, boxes. N equals 4 super Yang mills at one loop only has a box diagram, no triangle. So no triangle means, look at the sub diagram here, no triangle. You don't want any triangles there, you don't want any bubbles there. So this is the set of diagrams. Uh, that you get, you actually get a slightly bigger set, but turns out you don't need them. But you know, you, you, this is this is the set of diagrams that you write down, uh, where you demand no triangles, no bubbles, and that's just based on your knowledge of how one loop worked. And so this would be, we're going to talk about uh, n equals four super Yang mills. Now the best way to do that is to make use of this, these. Uh, 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 the numerator relations, the Jacobi relations, or dual Jacobi relations. Uh, now, you could say a priori, we don't know whether it's true or not, but the proper way to do it is you just be happy and you go forward and you assume it's true, and then we use our tools, this tool, to then verify the unitarity of any conjecture you have. So you, that's your conjecture. I think that's the set of diagrams that are sufficient. I think that all the Jacobi relations are going to work. Uh, in fact, let's look at uh, this one. See, A is equal to B. Let's have a look at, uh, at that one. So, Suppose I do a Jacobi, I mark the leg, I do a Jacobi on this leg. Right? Then what happens is I get three diagrams. Oh, let's write them down. There's one, that's the first one. Let me mark it. Second diagram, I want to twist. I twist the legs. That's number two. Okay, whoops. Oh, no, that's, I twist the legs like that. That's number two, so that's A, B, and then the next diagram uh, what I want to do is is have a three point um, so it's it's uh, it's like this. So that's my three points. So I'm going to surround the four point where I'm doing the Jacobi, around here, then around here. This one, it's not in my list. Why is it not in my list? Because, uh, oh, I see you have a problem there. Well, uh, it's not on my list because this has a one loop triangle. So this has a zero numerator. This doesn't belong. So this, I know ahead of time, this has zero numerator. In this is a property of n equals four super Yang mills. So the Jacobi identity is that this numerator, this numerator, anyway, th th this numerator is equal to that numerator. There it is. A is equal to B. Okay, and I go through the diagrams and I do Jacobi identities on them, uh, and I 
maybe not in all cases, but in some cases I've marked which Jacobi identity you want, you want to do, but then gives you nice relation, like let's say diagram J is a nice one. So diagram J, if you look at it, it looks just like diagram E. Oh, okay, I'm almost done with what I want to say. Uh, it looks just like diagram E. Um, uh, uh, sorry, the, uh, you know, except for, except for, except for this part of the diagram. It looks just like diagram E, except right around here. So when I do the Jacobi, in fact, when I get a two diagram E's, except leg one and two get swapped. And I just march through Jacobi identities. Uh, if, if, you're not, if you're not careful or you're not thinking through it too carefully, you can just do all of them, but that's uh, over redundant. You don't need to do that. You just carefully select ones that allow you to solve. And this has actually been arranged in a careful way. Let's watch this. Uh, a is the same as B is the same as, uh, uh, as C. C is the, given in terms of E. D is given in terms of H. H is given in terms of G and also I. And where was, uh, oh, I lost, uh, oh, I lost some identity. Oh, there it is. Uh, I lost some identities. And G is equal to, and E is one of them. Um, and, and, and also, uh, let's see. Yeah, NG is equal to NE equals uh, NF. Anyway, you can go through th these identities, and they're, of course, in the notes, and you will discover that every one of these diagrams, A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, can be written in terms of diagram E. So we can solve this in terms of E. So the punchline is that uh, when we're trying to figure out the unitarity constraints, if we assume this to be true, the only one that we actually have to get right is diagram E, and that determines all the other ones. Now, next time we're going to see how to do that more explicitly. I will hopefully solve it for you right on the blackboard. Uh, it's actually much simpler than you think because there's a set of constraints very similar to the box ident the box property that you can only have one loop boxes. You're not allowed to have one loop triangles. And if we impose those ideas, then actually the solution of the system is actually very simple. Uh, and this is a basic idea of how we do, let's say, four loops. Unfortunately, when we get to five loops, which I'll, we'll talk about next lecture, then uh, it gets more complicated. Somehow, we're unable to solve the system with the unitarity constraints. Uh, so then we need another way of doing it. And in fact, we do know the other way. So next time, I'll explain that. Take a five-minute yeah. break to wipe the blackboards uh, for U10.